how to make a masterful comedy of errors like Inside Number 9. Okay, excuse this for a moment, I am going to gush a little bit because I believe Inside Number 9 is a criminally underwatched show on the BBC. It's absolutely brilliant considering just how many fantastic episodes it has and how many awards it's won. Gushing over, back to the episode. If you are considering making a comedy of errors, well, good choice. It allows for a plethora of different tools, ideas, and genres that you can actually pull from to satirize and play with in the film. A Comedy of Errors requires many separate cogs in the machine to work effectively. Just like episode two of season one's Inside Number Nine, A Quiet Night In. Now, for those of you who don't know the show Inside Number Nine, every episode is a totally different world played by very similar actors with guest stars in various roles. What this does is this enables them to explore totally different stories in every single episode. So just like any TV show or movie, we need to set things up. We need to set up the world and we need to set up the characters. Now, just like most of the episodes of Inside Number Nine, they do this in a really interesting and unique way. They don't just kind of opt for the standard, hey, I'm doing this and hey, I'm doing that. So we begin by seeing a chap who sits down to eat his dinner. We're introduced now to the world of this show. As two thieves in the background are highlighted by a security light outside, we're now introduced to what this story will be about. So the next time the security light turns on, we now get to see one of the characters trying to hit the security light with a broom. We know this is a terrible idea, and would probably mean that they would get caught immediately, just based on the amount of noise he'd create. The second thief comes rushing in and shoos him away. So we now already know, we get an idea, roughly, one maybe is a little simple, but is willing to physically approach the problem, whereas the other is maybe a little bit more thoughtful, but is less physical. So when the security light turns on again, we see the second thief now crawling along the floor. He's trying to use his brain, being a sleuth, being less visible to try and approach the security camera. But when they realize that it's hopeless and they can't get past the security camera without triggering it, So this intro sets up the two behaviors of the thieves, setting up also the conflict that we're probably gonna see each time a challenge is thrown at them, because, well, they have two very different ways of approaching each problem. This introduction also lets us know just how badly prepared this pair are in trying to be thieves. Both characters are dressed in black, but there are subtle differences between the two which reveal even more of the character. Now, this is really important because even if they are very similarly dressed, there are ways in which you can make sure that the characters really come through in their clothing. One is wearing very tight-fitting, form-fitting, zipped-up jacket. He looks very sleuth-like. He's taking it very seriously. The other is, well, he's wearing the same color of clothing, but his jacket is open, it's baggier. Even the balaclavas that they're wearing, the ski masks that they're wearing, they seem to fit their heads in different ways. Once we understand that they're different, we understand therefore that there can be the potential for conflict and to surprise the audience. Next, we have the focus of the thieves' desire. There is a painting in the living room that they're trying to make their way towards. Now, I think it is incredibly important to note that putting the item of desire that they want to steal in plain sight in a space that will have a high thoroughfare for people that live in their house. The living room is a really interesting choice. Kudos where kudos is due, Rhys Shearsmith and Steve Pemberton. Brilliant choice here as writers to actually put the painting in a place which is so difficult. Now what this does do is it makes writing it 
harder, but it also means that you get to put your characters in situations that are going to not only reveal their belief systems more, but also make it more interesting for your audience to watch, allow you to twist and turn and surprise your audience more regularly, more easily as well. This also means you're less likely to end up utilizing a deus ex machina to solve a very difficult problem. So by creating strong characters and allowing us to understand how they solve problems, we then throw them into problems and allow the characters to solve them. Think about how the character would approach that situation, bearing in mind what they're trying to achieve. They then spend the next 10 full minutes throwing absolutely everything at the thieves to stop them getting to the painting. This is all of the types of cliches that we've seen before, from big guard dogs to family fights to the servants walking in, and they seem to get away with it each and every time, more out of luck than skill. Hope you still got some coffee. Don't forget to hit uh, share, like, and subscribe. Did you know, just you know, hit all of the buttons, all the buttons down below. You know, that'd be great, thank you. Now, we reach the midpoint. Now, it's really, really important to note that they're doing a lot in 30 minutes, and they're doing it in a way that's really interesting. They're tackling cliches, they're giving us satire and humor, but they're following strict story structure to the T. At the exact midway point in this episode, the thieves have the painting in hand. They are ready to escape. But as anyone who knows a little bit about story structure, the midpoint is the point where you get to do the big twist. So they have the painting in hand and ultimately they must now lose hold of the painting immediately. And so said, so done. There's something else here that they do This I think is a really nice tie into the satire of the show. The characters then recreate the painting that they've just stolen with kitchen roll and foil. This to me is as much the writers saying maybe how some art is viewed, especially when one of the characters that live in the house notice the painting. They don't think that the painting looks odd. They almost look impressed by the painting in a way. There is a moment here where the character is so close to getting the painting, but instead of twisting where the key might be to the lock or being so close to the key and it being ripped away, instead they throw a different twist at us. The woman that we think is about to leave her husband turns out to be a man. Now this doesn't actually have any story implications, but what it does do is it reveals something which Steve Pemberton and Reece Shearsmith continually state across all of their storytelling, including the League of Gentlemen series, which is again another cult classic. What they always come back to in their writing is this idea that nout is queer as folk. Behind closed doors, we're all just a little odd. Now what makes this truly successful as a story is that the fact that the writers stay true to the two main thief characters that we fully understand. And those characters actually act as the audience's own perspective on the world of this house. Until... And in true Inside Number Nine fashion, we get the big twist at the end of the episode, as unfortunately our two thieves are killed. And the painting that they tried so hard to steal is destroyed in the pool. And even worse, the painting that they had created out of kitchen roll and foil is thought to be the original painting and is stolen instead. So if you're about to make a comedy of errors, make sure your characters each approach problems in very different ways. This way you create innate, inbuilt conflict into every scene because you know anything you throw at them, each of them will disagree with the way in which that must be dealt with. 
but ultimately give yourself the chance, the space to explore the environment. The comedy of errors genre is a beautiful canvas from which you can explore themes and concepts which give us a peek at what it is to be another person. Awesome, thank you so much for making it to the end of the episode. If you know anyone else who might, you know, enjoy a little analysis or maybe they make films too, don't forget to share it with them. Cheers, thank you.